Hi everyone, this is two-time World Poker Tour champion Jonathan Little, and I want to tell you about my training site, PokerCoaching.com. Poker Coaching is the place to be if you want to increase your poker skills and learn to crush the games. It's the only place to quickly increase your win rate with active learning, so you can achieve your full poker potential without having to hire an expensive coach. Right now, podcast listeners can score a free membership by visiting pokercoaching.com slash card player and get access to top training tools like our interactive hand quizzes, our 7, 14, and 30-day challenges, and a roster of elite coaches such as Matt Affleck, James Romero, Burt Draftganger Stevens, Michael Acevedo, and dozens of others. Again, that's pokercoaching.com slash card player to get your free membership right now. By now, you've heard about Global Poker, one of the fastest growing online card rooms available in the US and Canada today. So what's stopping you from trying it out? Global Poker is a safe and secure social poker site that uses their own patented sweepstakes model. Signing up is easy. You can use Google, Facebook, or just an email address. You can always play for free on Global Poker, but you can also buy gold coins for additional play, which will earn sweeps coins that can be redeemed for real cash to a bank account, Skrill account, or even as a gift card. Get a free 5,000 gold coins when you sign up right now at GlobalPoker.com. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales, both on and off the felt. Hello and welcome back to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. This is episode number 148, and, uh, and yeah, it's been a while. We ended up taking a bit of a hiatus a few months ago. I ended up getting sick, and I lost my voice for over a month. And by the time I got it back, we were right in the middle of the busiest World Series of Poker in history. Speaking of the WSOP, congratulations to our new world champion, Dan Weinman, who won the main event for his second bracelet and $12.1 million. Today's episode, however, will focus on another bracelet winner from this summer in 37-year-old Mixed Games master Mike Gorodinsky. Mike picked a bracelet number three this June in the $10,000 horse event along with a payday worth $422,000. It was a great way to take the sting out of a summer that started out with him discovering his player box at Bellagio had been mysteriously emptied out. Mike's first bracelet came back in 2013 in a $2,500 Omaha and Stud High Low event, but his biggest score remains the $1.27 million he pocketed for winning the 2015 $50,000 Poker Players Championship. This was a really fun interview and we got to talk about a lot of fun stuff, including Mike's heads up battles with Phil Helmuth and JRB, uh, the massive pots he played in the biggest game in the world in Bobby's room, and even the unlucky sweater that he got from Doyle Brunson, which he has threatened to burn. Anyway, that is enough intro. Here is my conversation with Mike Gorodinsky. I am here with Mike Gorodinsky. Mike, how you doing? I'm doing well. Great. You're over there in Denver. How's the weather? Uh, nice, actually. Real nice. I imagine it's a little different than the sweltering inferno that you just got out of here in Vegas. Honestly, Vegas was kind of okay this year. I mean, it, you know, it was, it was hotter than home, but uh, it wasn't as bad as some previous years. Man, it is bad now. Let me tell you. <laughs> oh, is it? Yeah. You know, it's not. It's not safe out there. You know, uh, I guess the WSB dodged it uh, just in time. You obviously, of course, coming off of a great, successful summer where you won your third career WSB bracelet. We're definitely going to talk about that real quick. What are your thoughts on the new venue? It's been two summers now. Uh, I'm actually a fan. I uh, I think food wise, it's a massive upgrade. Um, space wise, it's actually a pretty big upgrade. My only real complaint is, you know, the parking situation. Like getting there is a little bit tougher than Rio, obviously. Yeah. But, uh, 
But if you stay on the strip, I think it's a massive upgrade to what we have. Is that what you did, or did you do the house uh, thing? I've done both now. So last summer I did the house, and it was fine. And this summer I was uh, I was at Paris for a while, and then I was at Bellagio, and both were were good and easy. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you mentioned on Twitter that this was like uh, the first summer where you really did the whole grind. Yeah, well, I mean, I've done the you know more or less the grind before, but this was the summer where I came in planning to just kind of play a WSOP event, uh, at least one every single day, versus like playing cash and then if I'm in the mood playing a tournament. Awesome. Well, we'll get to more WSOP talk, more cash game talk, but first on this show we go back to the beginning. So let's go back to to Russia. You were born in Russia. I was, yeah. I was born in St. Petersburg. Okay. And uh, how long were you there before you moved to the States? I was only there for, I think, four, maybe five years. And then um, we moved to Israel first, actually. And I was in Israel for uh, half a year, maybe a year. Um, my dad was there longer. Um, and then he got a position at the university in St. Louis. And so we moved. And I believe that was in 1991, 92. Okay. Do you have any memories of Russia? I have some, you know, like kind of uh, scattered memories, but I don't really, I, I don't really have a lot of like formative memories until I was quite a bit older. I, like, I, for whatever reason, I don't have a lot of memories from when I was, you know, zero to like seven. You mentioned your dad uh, was at a university. What did uh, your parents do? Uh, my dad has a PhD in physics, so he's uh, like he did research basically. And my mother was a gynecologist in, in Ukraine before, and then she, when we got to the States, she tried to do residency, but it was a little tough with raising a family and learning a second language. So she uh, eventually uh, was, just became like a researcher in my dad's lab. So you're half Ukrainian, half Russian? That is correct. That must be interesting. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, I mean, with IFC, I mean, with what's going on nowadays, exactly. it's, uh, <laughs> it's actually a fairly common mixture, um, so it's, a uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's tough to watch what's unfolding, it's bad for both countries, and, uh, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, popular support for it. Do you still have family back there? Uh, yeah, almost my entire family is either, oh, wow. is either in Ukraine or Russia. Wow. Um, uh, well, I guess on the lighter subject, you're, you're, your family moves over to the states. Uh, your dad to teach, I'm assuming. Uh, no. So he basically he like was in a lab doing research. It wasn't to teach. Okay. I assume there was a high emphasis put on your schooling. <laughs> uh, there, you know, there was. I have an older brother who I think got the brunt of the emphasis on education. Oh, that's so on. nice. That's so nice when you don't have to be the guinea pig. <laughs> It really is, yeah. <laughs> I was the older brother, and I got all the strict, you know, harshness, and then yeah, the I, I can siblings sense, just I can skate by. The older, the older brother jealousy coming in. Uh, <laughs> That's cool. Um, yeah. So, what was what was the, that like growing up in in St. Louis, and you know? Um, uh, I mean, it was good. You know, I, as a uh, as an English second language kid. Um, at my age, it was pretty easy. Uh, you know, I was just kind of uh, in elementary school making friends. Like, it didn't really matter that we didn't have a lot of money and that my English was rough. It was a little bit harder for my older brother. who was in high school age. My parents, you know, trying to assimilate and, you know, kind of figure out a new country. But uh, yeah. I, I had it pretty easy, honestly. What were your early interests back then? Early interests? I, uh... I really liked writing. I liked math before, uh, like basically before like the advanced classes started in middle school, high school ish. Um, yeah, and I was outside a lot. I was kind of just an outdoor kid. Okay. Yeah. And um, before we go any further, is is today your anniversary? <laughs> today is my anniversary. Actually, how did you know that? I, you know, I'm good at the Google, and in my research, I came across, I guess, a wedding announcement page or. Uh, something oh, about cool. yeah, uh, yeah. My, I mean, I'm I'm like technologically incompetent. My wife's been doing all that. Like, I don't even know if I ever <laughs> made an, an announcement about it. But yeah, it is our anniversary today, our one year. I apologize if I had known, <laughs> I wouldn't have requested any time from you today whatsoever. Well, no, we're doing our uh, we're doing like a you know like a fancy dinner in a few days. Today is just kind of a lazy day for us. So it totally works. Okay, okay. Well, I did see some pictures of you guys in Greece. So what was that like? You guys uh, uh, eloped? <laughs> yeah, we eloped. It was good. I, uh, I've, I have always not wanted a big wedding, like a big event. I don't really like the spotlight. So uh, 
I was glad to have, uh, you know, to have Kale and Ben on the same page. And so we just kind of got away and did it nice and greasy, and it was good. That is my one regret, was the big wedding. I wish we had done the oh, same, yeah. done the elope, you know, just make a fun trip out of it. <laughs> yeah, a wedding just sounds so witnesses. stressful, man. <laughs> It's a lot. It was a lot, and obviously it costs a lot. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So that was a big regret. All right, so uh, back to St. Louis. You end up going to school in St. Louis uh, College, right? Yep, I did all my schooling in St. Louis. So Washington University in St. Louis, for those who don't know, is a very prestigious school, like one of the best schools in the country consistently. Um, what What was that environment like? Well, I want to, you know, add the disclaimer that I would probably have not gotten into Wash U on my own merit. Uh, I think it really helped that a my older brother went there and graduated with some form of honors, and then my, uh, my both my parents worked there. Yeah, and, and, and you know, and I still got in on like some delayed admission, January admission thing. <laughs> but after after getting in, it was nice. It was a good experience. A there. win is a win. A win is a win. <laughs> so, uh, what did you study there? Uh, I was a psychology major. And I'm assuming a little bit of a poker major as well, right? You know, I yeah, I played um, I played online. I played in some um, in a couple like you know dorm room games, but it wasn't like I wasn't one of the kids that was like driving to the casino and spending 48 hours at the casino every weekend or anything like that. It wasn't really a focal point of my life until probably my like junior, seniorish year, where I was like starting to think about what I wanted to do with my life. And let's go back to the beginning. How did you find it in the first place? Uh, you know, kind of the same story that a lot of the guys my age have. I watched all of the WSFB coverage on ESPN when Moneymaker won. Kind of, you know, just got, like, hooked on the coverage. And then there were little home games while I was in high school. And I was playing, and I just, I'm very competitive about everything as it is. And I, you know, I just saw a game that I wanted to win at. And uh, I kind of studied and made my way from there. So immediately you're like, okay, where what where did I find the edge? You weren't oh, treating no. it like gambling. You know, no, actually, I was I was more of a degenerate when I was younger. I was just okay. playing and, and losing and frustrated, and so I just kind of consumed more content. But it wasn't really like, how can I make an edge? It was just like, I just like I just want to win. So I just played more and more, but not without really having like a a sort of study regimen like I probably should have. When did you go play online? Um, I played online uh, basically as soon as I turned 18 and it was legal. You know, it was it was pretty easy to get money on back then with all the sites running. And so I, I played during my senior year of high school and then I played on and off throughout college pretty irresponsibly because um, I was playing very high stakes and I was doing it like at 1 a.m. after getting back from, you know, some frat party or something. And I just really didn't take poker seriously in my uh, in my late teens, early 20s. But were you building a role, or was it... I built a I mean, yeah, I kind of, you know, I, I was clicking buttons and found a way to win. But, um, but it, was, <laughs> it was a very sloppy kind of uh, professional career, if you want to call it that. What were you playing, just mostly cash at the time? Yeah, so I played, I played basically all PLO online at the time, and, um, you know, I'd mix in some tournaments here or there, uh, but yeah, I, I, I just played whatever was fun for me. I, I didn't really treat it like a job, I just treated it like a, uh, like a video game at that age. So what was the turning point? I mean, did it come after you graduated? Was there a, a job lined up? Uh, there, was, there was never a job. I was it, about, like... Going into my senior year, I was pretty confident that I'd be playing poker afterwards, or at least be giving it a shot. Um, mm -hmm. But there was never really a turning point. I, I honestly was pretty reckless with my bankroll, with my study habits, just with poker in general, up until, I mean, embarrassingly, like probably about seven, eight years ago. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, you managed to... Uh... To, to point the ship in the right direction, at least. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I'm, I'm proud of where I've gotten, but uh, I, I could have taken it a lot more seriously, for sure. What did mom and dad think when you told them that you were going to take that degree and go play poker with it? Mom and dad were not thrilled. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, I mean, yeah, you know, especially to an older generation, um, professional gambling is not a thing. And I think my dad also was, was an unsuccessful gambler, uh, in his life, 
at, at a certain point, so it was especially maybe scary uh, in that regard. Um, but um, but yeah, I I did I did have good results, like um, or I think around when I was like twenty ish, and I was able to help out with their like um, mortgage on a house, and so I kind of after that, I think um, just after after being able to like win and hold on to the money, I think their opinions changed, and like nowadays. After I've had some like tournament success, they're they're always really proud and you know and brag about it and and that's that's always really nice. Yeah, I mean they're they're intelligent people. They can't argue the numbers, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean after a while, you just kind of have to uh, have to look at the look at the numbers and nod your head, right? So let's talk about those early days of you being a pro. You mentioned you were a little reckless with the bankroll. What what was it what, it like of uh, building the role, the ups and downs? Was there ever a moment where you thought maybe I don't do this maybe i go back to something else there were absolutely moments like that i mean you know it, it feels like embarrassing to talk about but it's just kind of you know it's a former version of myself i mean i i used to like in my really early online days i would just deposit like say 500 dollars and then you know play whatever i had like four buy-ins for and if i won the 500 i would kind of you know withdraw it back to my bank account and try to free roll and run it up and i did that countless times and eventually ran up a six-figure bankroll just because poker was, you know, extremely soft and you could. Uh, and so I did that and I, and I would kind of continue to do some version of that for a few years, just like squirreling away, you know, a hundred thousand here, a hundred thousand there. And, um, but at one point in college, I remember I had this pivotal moment where my bankroll was just drained. I've been playing a lot, you know, just kind of like just these degenerate sort of vibes to the way that I used to play. And I had, you know, run up a bankroll, run it down numerous times, and I had like 40000 or something. And I withdrew and bought a car just so I could be like, you know what, if nothing else happens, like at least I have this to show for my poker, right? This is my trophy. <laughs> yes, exactly. And so that happened, and I ran the remaining bankroll down to like $300 or something. And I was sick from college with some sort of flu. And I just entered the party poker, like, 215, you know, Sunday tournament. And I was just like, you know what, if I bust this, I'm just going to stop with the poker and, you know, like, go on a different career path. And uh, I just wound up finishing second or third in the tournament for, you know, I, I don't even remember anymore, like 50000 or something. And then, well, and then luckily never looked back from that day. But it's kind of funny to think how different my life could have been if that hadn't occurred. Right, everything changes. I mean, yeah, you, you still have a car, but I still have a car. I remember that car. It was an Altima Coupe, I think, blue. What do you think you'd be doing? Uh, you know, for a long time, and I and I still think that this is a possible, you know, career tree path for me. Uh, I wanted to teach. I wanted to teach high school English. Okay, you you do read a lot. I noticed on Twitter, you you tear through books. Yeah, I do. I do read a bunch. A lot of fiction too. I'm not a. Uh... I've always been a nonfiction guy. You, you I, like the fiction stuff, huh? I try to go like two thirds fiction, one third nonfiction. Yeah, because I, I like it as a uh, as sort of a downtime activity. I don't, you know, like my brain is stimulated enough for the rest of the day. I don't need to be learning while I read as well. Anything you've read that you're particularly jazzed about? Want to share? You know, recently I've actually been on a drought. I haven't read a book in like six months, which is my longest drought in like twenty years. Um. So no, not recently. Um, I mean, there's a lot of books that I that I would recommend, but as far as stuff that I've that I've read recently, I really can't think of anything. What's your all-time favorite then? My all-time favorite book. Uh, yeah. It's a tough question. It's a really tough question. I'm a. I like Hundred Years of Solitude, and then I like kind of as the collections. I like all the Vonnegut Mur Murakami stuff. Okay. So those are okay. sort of authors that I gravitate to. Yeah. And then I read a lot of like naturalist authors that write about like the interactions of the human and animal world. I really like like Sid Montgomery and some other authors like that. Uh, you big into nature? Uh, yeah, I'd say I'm a fan. <laughs> I mean, I well, I'm know. saying living in Denver, you got to do a lot of hiking, right? Do a fair bit of hiking. Uh, do a fair bit of climbing. Um, I honestly, I when I was in San Diego, I was in the ocean every day, and I missed that. That's kind of more where I'm where I'm at home. The mountains are fun, but I'm not. I don't take advantage of them as much as I maybe could. Did you have to move abroad for Black Friday? I did not. No, I um, because I lived in San Diego at the time, and I had a uh, 
I had an office in Tijuana that I would go to here and there to play. Um, and I sort of, there was a really good live game in San Diego at the time, Mix, and I just sort of jumped into it without knowing the rules and luckily uh, ran good and kind of built a career in Mix games from there. Well, let's talk Mix games. When did that come into play? Because I know you were you were early on in, 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 into PLO, right? Right. I was, I was exclusively a PLO player for a long time. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, Black Friday happened. I had been living in Boston at the time when it happened. I took a year off from, like, the poker crowd and moved in with some uh, childhood friends of mine there. And then I moved back to San Diego um, without really a concrete plan of what I wanted to do poker-wise. And the biggest game running in San Diego at the time was a 300-600 mix game. And I played, you know, maybe two of the games in the mix, but uh, <laughs> was told that uh, that the game was good, you know, as far as the, the kind of, like, the action players playing the game. And so I jumped in to learn and sort of took my bumps and bruises as I was learning, and it wound up being, a, you know, a really good risk that I took for, uh, for my career path. Yeah, I guess you've never been afraid to just jump into the biggest game. Uh, yeah, which uh, which has you know both been a uh, a detriment and uh, and a good thing. Well, uh, you told a story to one of our other reporters a few years back that the first time you even entered a casino, you sat down in the biggest game. Uh, yeah. That, oh, uh, where in Australia? In Australia, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess, but I mean, the biggest game there wasn't huge. It was like a uh, like a ten twenty no limit game or something. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> Still, most people usually, you know, slum it at the one-two game for when their first it's experience. True, it's true, yeah, yeah. I, I you guess, came, I guess you came in with some confidence and a roll, right? I did. I, I definitely had more confidence than I should have. What was the transition like for live poker to you? Did you prefer it? Did you find that it was? Uh, I, you know, I like both separately. Um, they're 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 completely different skill sets. They're completely different experiences. I uh, I like live poker. I think, it, but I find it more like when I go play live, it's like relaxing for me. You know, it, it, it doesn't have the sort of like work based component that online can sometimes feel like. Because online is so intense, you're playing so many more hands, and it's so much more mentally draining and stimulating. You mentioned that big mixed game in San Diego. You're obviously also no stranger to Bobby's room. Uh, any cool stories from there? Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of cool stories. I, uh, I haven't played the Bobby's room game in a few years. I sort of uh, finally realized that I just, you know, I'm, I'm a very good mixed player, but I can't really compete with the 10 best mixed players in the world. So it's been a few years since I've played. But, um, but yeah, I mean, back when Doyle was playing every day, uh, it was just, uh, it was a really cool experience, you know, I kind of, as I've moved up stakes in poker, right, I've gotten to meet, I mean, meet everyone at this point that I considered, like, a, I don't know if hero is the right word, but, you know, someone that I looked up to watching high stakes poker and more WSOP coverage, and, uh, you know, getting getting to play in really high stakes games with, like, Doyle and Ivy uh, was, a, was, yeah, it was a really cool foundational experience. Uh, you and Doyle had some beef, right? Some fake beef, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had some fake beef. It was fun. Yeah, what was that all about? Uh, nothing really. I mean, I you know Doyle probably legitimately thought that I was a fish. My feelings may have been mutual, and uh, and you know we just sort of you know just I think the both of us are uh, are good with some banter at the table, some banter off the table. It was never uh, it was never anything serious. It was always fun. I saw you posted uh, on Twitter that he gave you like a bad luck sweater. Yeah, I mean it's still hanging in my closet somehow. I haven't, I haven't had the heart to burn it. But yeah, I ran so <laughs> bad for like two straight years. That's hilarious. Um, what, what about like the biggest games you ever played? Uh, the biggest game that I've ever played was in Bobby's room. It was a four uh, K, eight K game. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the few games that I've sold action to. Um, and uh, yeah, I was. Um, it was at the. It was actually at the tail end of a summer where I started the summer off on like a nice, like million dollar plus heater, and then had lost most of it back. And this game sprung up, and I was sort of dejected and really didn't want to play it. It was bigger than I wanted to play. But then a couple guys that were playing a smaller game in Bobby's room were like, "Hey, I'll take a piece. This game looks amazing." So I sat down and had the the biggest winning day of my life. So it was pretty cool. Can you give uh, some details on the numbers? Um, yeah, sure. I won, I think, uh, 860000 that day. 
after, <laughs> after being stuck like uh, almost 400. So it was a million dollar swing in a day, which is the only time I've done that outside of a tournament win. So it was uh, it was cool. It was definitely a, uh, a a unique life experience. Does 4K 8K get the blood pumping any more than 400 800, or is it all poker? Uh, it definitely gets the blood pumping more. I mean, you know, I think it's pretty natural for everyone that, like, especially because 4K AK is very, very clearly outside of my comfort zone, outside of my bankroll comfort. Um, I would only play it in a special, in a special circumstance. So yeah, every pot feels meaningful, and uh, I'm definitely hyper focused on every decision that I make, and I'm never going into cruise control the way that I might at a smaller six. You mentioned uh, that was one of the few games you sold action for. I, I'm, I'm assuming you like to to have most of yourself in in these games. Uh, I mean, yeah, to a detriment, right? I I had a, I had all of myself for many years playing like fifteen hundred, three thousand to two K, four K, and I had some really, really like irresponsibly big losses near the end of my. Uh, stretch playing that game, which I, you know, in many ways regret, just because it's like looking back and it's just so irresponsible and unnecessary. Well, um, some people find that they they play better if it's their own money, or some people find the opposite. They play better if if they have the peace of mind that it's someone else's. So for me, I I have always struggled to play my A game when um, someone else has a piece of me. That's why, I, like, I don't do a lot of swapping in tournaments. Even I don't like the selection for tournaments because I just. I don't like to be held accountable for my plays to other people, and I, I like I, I just I feel like I don't um, maybe pull the trigger on some of my gut instincts that may look foolish, you know, uh, when the cards are flipped up if someone has a piece of me. So I right, because then you have to justify it later. <laughs> right, and, and I mean most of the people about my action like would never would never request that of me. Um, right. But still, it's kind of in the back of my head, and so I I like to just have all my actions and only be answerable to myself. Well, let's talk about tournaments. Uh, we mentioned the three bracelets. When did uh, the tournament focus come into play for you? Um, you have a win here from 2010 at the PCA. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it was never a focus of mine. I, I like playing tournaments. I think they're fun. Um, it, it, if anything, it, I kind of view them as a, like fun change of pace departure from the kind of day-to-day -day grind of playing cash. And I still more or less view them that way. Like I said, last summer was the first summer where I went in and I was like, I'm going to play tournaments every single day. Um, whereas otherwise, it's more just like, I'll be playing cash and, uh, you know, if I feel like I need a break from that, I'll go and play a tournament. And that's m more or less what it was like for me up until the last few years. Yeah, the results are... are Definitely sparse when you were grinding the cash. I did notice here, though, at that PCA, that eight-game championship event, you won it, finished runner-up, and then won it again in three consecutive years. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, that was that was really cool. And then actually, that that tournament was responsible for giving me a lot of confidence in playing mix, and especially in playing tournament mix, because uh, especially back to that, and having a background in big bet, so in PLO and no limit, um, it really was a huge. Uh, edge in that tournament where a lot of the guys that only played mix really kind of played scared in those games and I felt like I, I mean, I still more or less feel that way, but I really felt like I had a big edge in those tournaments like 10 well, years ago or so. Let's talk PLO because I, you bring up something interesting that I've noticed. I know people think, you know, people who don't study the game think that PLO is just a game of flipping coins because the mm. You know, the equities run so close to each other. But there's a reason why we see the same 20 people deep in these tournaments, at least in the tournaments, PLO, every single summer. It, the, the edge in PLO tournaments seems crazy high to me for the people who know what they're doing, whether it's the Sean Deebs or the, you know, Tommy Lee Lays or, you know, of the world. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it certainly seems to be a tournament game where the, uh, where the cream rises. Do you is there something that w that most people aren't seeing that you've picked up on? Um, as far it, as PLO, PLO, it just seems like the best players are very good at recognizing leverage spots. Yeah, so in all those that, medium pots that no one really plays for. You know what um, I mean? It's more. I think it. It's more the PLO tournaments bottleneck twice, right? They. 
in the beginning, you have a lot of people that are going to be playing too loose, like where kind of like the recreational money comes in, and so the good players are able to take advantage of that, you know, deep stack. They're going to, you know, usually get their money in good. And then just sort of the nature of PLO tournaments and how close the equities do run, uh, when you get down to like the money bubble and the final table bubble, uh, big stacks have a really big advantage, right, because the equities are so close and they're able to raise, um, they're able to raise first in a lot and take it down because everyone else is sort of disincentivized from playing a big pot with someone when the equities are so close between your very best hands and their kind of middle of the road hands. And so like big stacks are just able to accumulate a lot easier in a PLO tournament than say, you know, like a mixed tournament or maybe an Olympic tournament. So is it still the case that these big bet games like PLO play are more important like in the PPC or the Poker Players Championship? Uh, I mean, yeah, you know, if you are... I mean, yeah, I, I would say that they are two of the most important games in the mix, right? If, if you're if you're just downright bad at those games and you play them loose, it's it's going to be tough to advance. Well, games. right. Maybe it's maybe it's not so much that they are that much more important. It's just that the field is made up of people who are used to limit games, <laughs> um, and you know, which would explain uh, Michael Mizraki's three wins and, you know, his stellar record, and they're obviously a guy... Yeah, definitely. Like, he, hyper he, he's absolutely a guy that's able to punish the guys that are scared to play big, big pots in, in PLO and no one. Well, let's talk about the bracelet wins. You got your first in 2013, the uh, Omaha stud split game. What did, what did it feel like to win a bracelet, first of all? Was that a big bucket list item for you? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I... As far as like viewing a bracelet win as sort of like a you know dream come true thing that happened with my second bracelet, but the first one was you know was random. I wouldn't consider myself a good stud eight or O eight player at least back then, and um, it was just it was like a very strange tournament to get a win in. But it felt great, you know. I had my San Diego buddies there on the rail. It was a uh, it was just a cool like formative you know early poker experience. And then before we get to the second win. You had to go and lose to Helmy in the Raz. <laughs> I sure did. What was that like? What was that experience like? That was uh, that was that was probably what you would expect it to be like. It was pretty unpleasant. Uh, I had <laughs> I had like a two to one or a three to one chip lead going in a heads up too, and uh, you know Phil Phil won a lot of hands heads up. Uh, you know credit to him. He's a good Raz player. Um, but uh, but yeah, you know he, he wasn't always throughout the match, the most gracious opponent. And so uh, it just kind of was what it was. And it's got to be tough. But I feel like most people are rooting against you, right? They want to see Phil win something. Not, yeah, not yeah, definitely. Well, like, you know, it depends who you talk to. I think I think I probably had some supporters there for myself as well. Yeah, I but guess yeah, as true. far as like the people on the rail, yeah, it was a very uh, healthy, heavy crowd. What was it like when you were heads up with JRB <laughs> in the 50K? Uh, that was, that was great. I mean, I, I, I think I went in, I, I don't remember if I went in as the chip leader, if we were pretty even or what, but, uh, but yeah, I actually, I had beaten him heads up in one of those PCA mixed events as well. So I had that like confidence already playing him heads up in a tournament in a big spot. And, um, yeah, the card is one of my way. It was really cool. People probably rooting for you more in that spot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. I'm sure he had his fair share of supporters on the route. Okay, well that that's obviously one you know the tournament right for mixed game players. Um, was that validation? I mean, was it even life changing? I mean, you had a you're playing nosebleed stakes before that, but uh, one point three million is still a lot of money, you know. Yeah, I mean that tournament was everything. Um, it was definitely validation. It was like I legitimately used to have dreams about winning that tournament. I mean, my heads up opponent in the dreams was Ivy, not JRB, but you know, it was, <laughs> it's still a similar thing. Um, and no, I mean, I I was playing big, but I wasn't playing nosebleeds really at that time. I I had maybe taken some shots in Bobby's room up to that tournament, but uh, after the win, I I, I played pretty con pretty consistently for like I don't even know, like five to seven years or so. Uh, I saw you posted on Twitter that the tournament is is interesting to you because you've also bubbled it and also were the first player out of it. <laughs> I've I've literally done it, I, and so I think I'm the only person that has ever done this in a like long standing like annual tournament. I have been the first player out twice now, uh, which I'm what not, twice? Yeah, which I'm not super proud of. 
Um, I have mid-cached, I have uh, stone bubbled it, I have final table bubbled it, I've won it, and I've been at the final table and not won it, obviously. So I've, I've just like done everything you can do in that tournament. <laughs> Does that feel like a tournament you're going to play forever? Uh, it's definitely what I like to. You know, I actually I haven't even played it every year for the last like ten years. I think I've maybe played it only seven times, something like that. I, uh, yeah, if, if I'm if I'm in the mood and I'm feeling like I'm in a good headspace, I play the tournament. And if I'm not, I you know I have no problem skipping it because it's a big tournament. And if I'm there, I want to take it seriously. Before we get to the latest uh, results. How was your COVID? What did you uh, What did you spend? I know you grew out a long mountain man beard, but yeah, I had a mountain man beard. What I, I mean, COVID. I a lot uh, of took the opportunity to play online. You know, I got, I mean, yeah, I did. I played a lot online. Um, I mean, we you know I I got into gardening a little bit with my wife. Uh, we saw we saw friends pretty regularly, and then. For the first part of COVID, the mountains were actually kind of like closed off in Denver, but um, eventually they realized that was an insane decision and everything was open. So I, I you know, I, I was climbing a fair amount with friends. I was, I was outside. I, I, I found COVID pretty, pretty okay overall. But you were eager to get back to live poker, I assume. Um, yeah, I mean, for sure. I was, I was excited to like go to that first series, and I was excited in general to be able to do some traveling. Uh, you finished second last summer in the 10K Dealer's Choice. Any regrets there? Any regrets? Yeah, my biggest regret is making Ben a good player. So the guy that he <laughs> is, uh, is a guy that I play with online a lot, and um, and I had definitely kind of like helped him hone his mix games a little bit. Like we just talk, and you know, he's a, he's a nice guy, friendly guy, and so we chatted. And I I definitely made him a better mix player, and then losing to him heads up in a mix tournament was not ideal. This is Ben Diebold? Yes. Congrats to Ben. But then this summer, you got him at the 10K horse event, $422,000 and your third bracelet. You know, three bracelets, now that's putting you in elite company, right? You can you can fluke one, you might you might get two, but three, and now you're starting to separate yourself. Oh, um, yeah, maybe. I, uh, I'm not really is sure. That, do you not feel that way? <laughs> no, not really, honestly. I, I mean, I'm, I'm fairly confident in my poker game anyway. I don't really need the third brace of validation. But, uh, but yeah, it, it's always such a fun experience to be down there at the end, playing a final table, winning a bracelet. It, they're all like, you know, they're such rare experiences that, uh, that I'm, I'm definitely grateful every time it happens. Well, let's talk about bracelets in general. Uh, well, first of all, where do you keep yours? Do you have like a trophy for them, or are they just in a box somewhere? Um, my first two bracelets are with my parents, actually, in Jersey. And this third one is just on my uh, it's on a bookshelf right now in my office. So I'm not really sure what I'm going to do with it. I'll probably no. give it to somebody. I, uh, I don't really have any like, trophies around the house. Nobody's called dibs, huh? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'll let the... The Gordinsky clan fight over that one. Helmut's <laughs> given away all but one of his. Which right. Is crazy. 17, you know. Uh, well, I, I, think, I think that's a cool thing to do with them, actually. Because then, you know, it's like someone else has a cool gift and you kind of get, like, the, the satisfaction of, um, you know, kind of having them spread out. Yeah, and then every day you pass it, you think of Helmuth at your house, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, well, what are your thoughts on just the amount of bracelets being offered nowadays? I mean, we're, we're going to pass 100 next year. Uh, I mean, I'm not a fan. I think that the watering down of the bracelet is, uh, is unfortunate. Um, I think, if, if nothing else, they should have done a separate category for online bracelets. And I do think that there should... It, you know, and this is like such an elitist viewpoint, but I do think that there should be a minimum buy-in or something for a bracelet because, it, it, like, one of the cool things about the series for me, my first two years was coming out, and it's sort of like the big stage, right? It was the uh, it was the place where like all the pros gathered. I was very, like I felt very. Like, I felt like I was in a lead company when I went to my first few summers, right? Where, like, when I was playing the tournaments, it always felt like a shot, and it felt like this monumental experience to get to play these, like, high stakes with these great players. And um, and so I think that that sort of aura, prestige around the bracelet was really cool, and I do think that having these, like, smaller events... Um, 
and bracelet events, waters it down a little bit. I, I don't really care, but I, you know, if asked to give an opinion, I, I guess that's where I stand. It is interesting that we're going backwards as far as the buy-in is concerned. When you know, if you look at the, I think the smallest buy-in at the first WSOP, or not the first, the second WSOP, was five thousand dollars. Yeah, and, and if you count the early inflation, 70. it was huge. It was like twenty-five thousand. It's thirty-seven thousand dollars today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so, I mean, the the uh, with that argument, the smallest buy-in at the series could arguably be somewhere in the range of twenty-five k, and really only attract right. the elite of the elite. If it were to have remained on that trajectory, yeah, you know that it and did so, in the seventies. <laughs> I get why they run the smaller events. I mean, they're immensely popular. They generate a ton of break, and it gives you know it gives a ton of players a chance to play WSP event. I totally get it. And I think it's great, and it's not like winning that bracelet is easy. It's extremely tough. It's way tougher than winning like a 10k bracelet. Um, oh, but yeah, don't say that out loud. Don't say that too loud. Some some pros might, <laughs> might not like that. I hear that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I do, th but I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, I, I, I liked back in my early days, which, you know, wasn't the early days at all, but like the, you know, 2010-ish era where you came and everything was just like high stakes and it felt elite and I, I liked that vibe of it, but at the same time I could afford those buy-ins, so I'm biased there, right? So it's like, um, you know, I, it, it, on the whole, it's probably better that it appeals to a wider range of people. Right, I guess there's, you know, there's Triton and Poker Go for all the the high rollers, and that could kind of be, like, the new inflation, you know, standard, but... uh. Yeah, and, and I mean, honestly, if they start running, like, mixed events, maybe that's where, like, the uh, prestige trophy comes in, and the WSP just becomes a different sort of product, um, and, that, and that would be fine, you know? Yeah, well, you know, the Poker Go, I think, ran a mixed game series uh, earlier this year in a PLS yeah, series. Yeah, so. by the way. It was super well run, like, really great idea, and I hope they continue to run one or two of those a year. It was all continue to support those as often as I can. It does seem like more and more high-stakes players are dipping their toes into the other games, maybe finding Hold'em to be a little <laughs> tougher Yeah, uh, to, yeah, to extract. It certainly seems that way. Okay, what are your thoughts on just poker celebrity in general? You, you, I know you saw um, the high stakes poker with Nick Airball and weren't too too uh, pleased. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just uh, it's it's just not like how I got into poker, so I I think for me it's hard to watch. But like, um, so for me the. The, like, the attraction and the entertainment value was being able to visualize myself as one of the people in the game, right? And, like, high-stakes poker, I mean, it was, for the most part, you know, five pros and one recreational player. And that's how every episode was. And so there was a lot of, like, fairly high-level play. And, um, you know, there was the splashing and the gambling and the props on the side, and that was cool because you got this glimpse into the poker world. But, um, but the poker that gets streamed nowadays is this, like, all private, all, you know, like, tons of just, like, kind of, like, it's just, to me, it's a bunch of money, it's a bunch of people throwing around money that is valueless to them. And that is just not, like, an entertaining product for me personally. I know that it is for other people, so I know that's why they run it, but, like, I don't really get anything out of that kind of poker content. Well, as part of it's, you know, the, our fault, the media's fault, uh, in in who we continue to prop up there. Who, what would who would you like to see? Like, uh, maybe not a specific name, but the type of person do you think should be getting attention in the poker world? Should be getting attention. Well, it, you know, it's tough because there's. I I think the reason that a lot of the games that are broadcast now are broadcast is because there really aren't that many players that play at a super high level that are also like. Uh, entertaining characters and so i think that's a valid criticism of having like the uh you know like the triton stuff um uh broadcast where it's a final table of you know like nine kind of like game theory solver based players because a lot of times those guys do struggle to kind of bring character to the table and i think it's a it's a valid criticism um so for me like a stream that i would love is and it's, it's tough because you have, you have to incentivize the guys that play for money to come to those games. 
um, nowadays. In the past, they used to just want to come and play, but now it's like you have to dangle out a carry of some sort. But it's like, I like having one or two players that play recreationally, that play for fun, and then kind of five to six guys that are professionals that, you know, ground their money up in poker that are there and that are competing at stakes that are meaningful to them. Like, I think that that's the, that's the dynamic that I personally want to see the most. Would it be crazy to make the stakes meaningless, like entirely meaningless, go the other way with it, and just watch a bunch of people have like a friendly home game? You know, uh, and it wouldn't do it for me personally, but uh, but maybe for someone else. Like I, for me, part of what is in inter- like I, I like when I watch poker, it's at the highest stakes where I know the money is meaningful to people. So. I, you know, it's, it's just, it's exciting for me to watch the pot. It has to hurt. Yeah, exactly. It has to hurt a little bit. (laughs) Gotcha. All right. Uh, well, you mentioned, uh, your run at the WSOP. You have a banner because you became the 2015 player of the year. Uh, what's that like seeing your face up at the, (laughs) up on the walls? Honestly, I like it. I, uh, yeah, I don't know if that's egotistical to say. But, uh, <laughs> that's better than a bracelet to me, having the banner. That's crazy. Yeah, you know, I, I, I really, I didn't like, uh, I mean, I went to Germany the year that I was close and I competed for it, but it, like, it wasn't something that had a lot of meaning for me when I was going for it. But now every year getting to see that same banner, and it, it's, it's honestly cool. Like, my wife really likes it. She thinks it's funny. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, it's neat. It's, it's a cool accomplishment to just get to look at every year. Awesome. Well, we end our podcast with some rapid fire questions. If you're ready. Sure. Throw them out. Okay. Uh, on a scale of one to 10, how normal are you? Mm, eight. I'm pretty normal actually. Really? I don't yeah. think a poker player can ever, ever be above a six. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. I, I, just I, because I, it's such a weird life, you know what I mean, compared to the average s- human being. But I agree with you, but I'm like I'm very tame for a poker player. I, yeah. I, I really I really think an eight is a fair evaluation. Do you think and do you think like a poker player when you're not playing poker? You yes. know, are you cal- are you calculating the E V of the dinner menu? <laughs> Uh, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I, that's just not the kind of poker player that I am, so I'm not doing that. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I do sort of think in terms of like, uh, of you know, what's the likelihood something happens every time I do something, and and I try not to be results oriented in my day to day thinking. Uh, do you have any hidden talents other than drawing pictures of poker players? <laughs> I don't know if I'd call that one a talent. Uh, no, I think, and I think this is actually pretty typical for poker players. I'm just kind of like good at a lot of games, at a lot of like various games. I don't know if I call that a hidden talent, but like video games, board games, any game. Yeah, just kind of all of the above. I I I am very competitive, and I tend to learn games faster than your average bear. Uh, what's your favorite? My favorite game. Yeah, non poker game. Like like you have friends over. And you wanna you wanna show off a game? What are you breaking out? Show off a game. I you know I haven't I actually I haven't played like a board board game in a really long time in France. A lot of it is like athletic type stuff. You know, it's like uh, like a darts or basketball or something like that. Okay. You know. You got you got a shot, huh? I got a bit of a shot. <laughs> All right. Um, what was the best? Speaking of shots, what was the best shot you ever took in your career? Uh, poker wise. Sure. Um. Well, I had a hundred myself, hundred percent of myself in the fifty k that I won the player poker player championship. So that was probably the uh, the best shot. Nice. And what was the worst shot you ever took? Um, the uh, the summer when I I was doing well in the fifteen hundred three thousand mixed game in Bobby's room, and it got kicked up to two k four k, and I continued to just take all my own action, and I had three of my biggest losing days back to back to back. That was definitely the worst one. Do you do anything special to shake off, you know, losses like that, or is it uh, just time? No, not really. You know, it's, it's, it's especially tough during the series where um, you're just kind of inundated with poker every single day. So it's it's tough to really get away from it there. It, at home, I, I do, you know, I try to just, like, break up my losing sessions with time with community. Like, uh, I try to sweat it out playing some sort of sports on or something. So I, I have, like, my sort of rituals in place to deal with big losing sessions when I'm home, but it's, it's a lot harder in Vegas. Uh, your most prized possession? Uh, the 
you know, I, I'm not a very material person. Um, I mean, does my dog count? <laughs> sure, sure. What's my dog is definitely name? my most prized possession, though. <laughs> What's your dog's name? Her name is Penny. Penny. All right. Is this like a run alongside you outside dog or a sit on your lap inside dog? Uh, she's a she's a mix. She's older now, so she's ten. So she used to be like a you know big fetch enthusiast, and now she's more into like cuddling on the couch. There you go. That's good yeah. retirement. It is. Um, you said you don't like to swap much, but is there is there a good swap that ever came through that someone ever? Um, did you ever take a piece of somebody who uh who who uh made you some money? I mean, yeah, sure, but I'm 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 notoriously unlucky as far as like buying action and swapping goes. Uh, I, but yeah, I've had I've had some. I haven't had any like anything over six figures as far as the swap goes. I I had a piece of Dan Smith when he had a I think a second place in some Triton event uh, years ago that was almost the six figure score. And then I had some pieces of other good poker players in events recently where you know. It netted me like twenty, thirty thousand or something, but nothing huge or life changing through swaps. What about the weirdest place you've ever played poker for money? Weirdest place I ever played poker for money? Uh, probably in New Zealand. Um, it was my, only my like second or third live venue that I played at, but it was—I mean, it was built as a casino and they had casino chips. But we played in this like restaurant setting um kind of in this dingy part of town in uh, queenstown and um yeah I, I i don't know i maybe luckily lost in that game so i didn't have to deal with cashing out and actually seeing my money but uh but it was a pretty sketchy environment speaking of travel you traveled quite a bit i saw you went to the galapagos uh any what was the best trip and what what's uh something still on your bucket list um, the best, I, I mean, New Zealand, again, was one of my favorite trips. It's one of my favorite countries I've ever visited. Super fun, super beautiful, like, natural country, you know, not uh, overdeveloped. Um, Galapagos actually was also a great trip on my brother. And bucket list stuff that I haven't done yet, uh, Japan is definitely top of my list. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd like to go to India as well. I haven't been, uh, like, Thailand, kind of that, that general part of the world. They got to start having high stakes mixed games in Japan, I guess. Yeah, I mean that's a trip I'll take. Uh, I'll take Sans Poker. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think uh, yeah, Japan's very, very high on the bucket list. Do you collect anything? Uh, I collect poker chips. I have you know chips from every casino I've played at. Um, mm -hmm. Do I collect anything else? That's uh, that's it. Like I said, I'm not I'm not a super material person, so I try to I try to like limit the amount of just stuff I have in my house. Do you keep those chips in a box? They are in a, um, they're in like a, a, a weird ceramic coffee cup that I got somewhere, but uh, I've been planning on eventually, you know, having them hang in my office once I get around to like buying some sort of appropriate uh, thing for them. I only ask uh, to bring up the obvious question that hit you this summer, <laughs> uh, which I'm sure you're tired of talking about, but uh, has there been any update on, on the chips you lost at Bellagio for... Uh, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm happy to give a to give a quick kind of uh, conclusion on that. So I did a I did a talk with Chad Hallway of Poker News where he posted it, which basically has all the thoughts. And I did a, a quick like 15 minute thing with Berkey and his podcast. But um, yeah, so the Blasio will not be compensating. Uh, we have a difference of opinion about what occurred. I mean, essentially, they ran a security review and found that uh, you know I was the only person that accessed the box. Obviously, my uh, version of events is that I left the box uh, not empty, and um, and yeah, uh, that's uh, that's kind of where we stand. For those that don't know, I went to access my box early in the summer, and my key got stuck, which had never happened. They had to drill my box, and it came out empty. Um, I did not leave it empty the last time I was in Vegas, and I had an ongoing thing uh, back and forth with Blanche while they conducted their security review, and afterwards. Um, talking about compensation, etc., and their uh, their official position was that they won't. Um, you know, you do sign a liability release when you open a box, and so basically to put a bow on it, I will not be getting compensated. I decided not to litigate because the amount in the box was luckily not life changing for me, and I don't want to risk 
any kind of uh, ban or anything in MGM properties. I don't want to damage my reputation with anyone at MGM. Um, but for those that do have a box at casinos, I would, uh, unless you really need a box for whatever reason, if you're dealing with a lot of foreign ships or cash, uh, like if, if front money deposits are fine for you, I would just recommend always doing a front money deposit because, uh, you know, there's a paper trail and the liability is not on you in case something goes wrong. So. Well, I imagine the paper trail is why people have the box <laughs> in the yeah, first place. Right. But, but yeah, and I'm not someone that had a box with the intention of evading any kind of, you know, government paper trail. So it was just kind of an unnecessary risk for me to take. Right, but you know, the, the Bellagio isn't a bank. They're not going to count it. They're not counting every chip, you know, like. Yeah, exactly. Of course. So, uh, you know, the, the repercussions of this seat are that, you know, players have to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically the the main um, insight that I have from that whole thing is that, you know, you should kind of uh, include some risk into having a box at a casino, basically. Like, it's not a completely risk-free uh, endeavor, like uh, I certainly thought it was, and that I think the majority of people think when they open one. Well, uh, sorry that happened to you, and, uh, you know, fortunately, you bounced back strong. Um Let's see here. A few more questions, and then I'll let you go. Oh, what was your largest non-poker wager? Non-poker? So, like, in the pit or something at a casino? Or maybe a sports bet or a prop bet, maybe? Um, you know, probably my biggest wager was... Uh, I had $35,000 of action down on uh, JC against Olivier when they fought. Wow. <laughs> Back then, which was not a uh, great bet, obviously, as it turned out. Um, yeah, and I, I don't think I've had anything bigger than that. That was two poker players fighting each other, for those that don't know. JC, uh, Alvarado, and Olivier Busquet. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of money to have on two non-fighters fighting. <laughs> yeah, I got some bad, uh, quote-unquote, sharp information about that one. <laughs> um, what was your worst job before poker? Uh, you know, I had very few jobs. I've, I I worked at a St. Louis bread company, uh, which is a Panera Bread, essentially. Uh, that was my first job, which I got fired from on 420 uh, when I was in high school. So <laughs> I, did, I did great there. And, uh, and I, I worked in, like, a, a marble warehouse, just kind of carrying marble around. I, which, both, both, those, oh, both those jobs were fine. My worst job was uh, I did a summer of exterior painting. Oh. Uh. Yeah, that would that would suck in the hot St. Louis summers. Yeah, that that was that was really not a great job. When you said marble factory, I was picturing you guys making little marbles. But now the, now the okay, yeah, mar like there's marble floors, idiot. Like what am I thinking? Yeah, <laughs> that job actually would have been a lot easier. I imagine those little marbles are a little lighter to carry. Around. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you just get a sack of them. You're all good. <laughs> um, if you could download one skill instantly, like in the Matrix, what would you choose? One man, that's a really good question. I, uh, I've actually, I, I'm a bad sleeper. Like I just get bad sleep. Oh. And I, and I think that I would download either just the ability to get like eight solid hours every night, or just the ability to function. Because you know there are just people out there. Like uh, my friend Cole South is one of them that always comes to mind. Because I used to travel with him a fair bit. That just like he can get three hours of sleep and just be like a normal, high functioning human being. And I just yeah. can't, you know, and it makes such a difference in your, in the amount of impact you're able to have on a day-to-day -day basis. Man, I, I, I'm with you on that. Sleep is so hard. Good sleep is so hard to come by. And yeah, if, you it really get is. It, if you can get it, thank everyone you know. Um, let's see. Do you have any nicknames? Uh, Gordo's the only one. Gordo. Uh, does it offend you that it, that it means fat? No, I mean, you know, it's, it's a play. It's kind of a play. <laughs> I've always been pretty slim growing up. Now you're kind of pressured into staying slim, though. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be really hard for that. Like, I've, I've actively tried to put on weight for like 10 years. I just can't do it. <laughs> Who are the four players on your poker Mount Rushmore? Mount Rushmore? Well, if you, if you want to do sk skill and just like being an ambassador is slightly different for me. I think if you want to do an ambassador Mount Rushmore, it's got to be Daniel, Ivy, Doyle, and, and Helmuth. Uh, but if you want to do skill, I, um, I think probably, and skill is a tough one, I haven't thought about something like this in a while. I mean, probably Michael Thuritz, 
I still put Ivy on there just because of how long he was dominant for. I mean, you, I, I think you probably would have to put Doyle on there, even though, you know, like in his last years when he was in his late 80s, like, you know, maybe he wasn't the best player at the table anymore, but for so long he was dominant that uh, I think you got to put him on the Mount Rushmore. And then, you know, there's just so many great younger players now that play that probably deserve a spot on there eventually, like the Rast Seavers of the world. Uh, who was your celebrity crush growing up? Uh, it's a weird one. I, for whatever reason, Julia Stiles. That's not that weird. Yeah, maybe not. I don't know. Ten th- was it 10 Things I Hate About You? Was that, was that yeah. Her? Yeah, that's right. That'll work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, do you wear headphones on at the table? Uh, I, I usually don't. I, I put headphones in if there's someone at the table that, uh, that rubs me the wrong way for the most part, and that's, mm-hmm. that's not it. That's a good reason. Yeah. Uh, if you could name the entertainment for the Super Bowl halftime show, who would you choose? Ooh, uh... Man, I don't know. Uh... I might just, like, throw it back to a Jay-Z or something. I don't really know. Okay. Well, I mean, it'll be popular. Yeah. Do you have a celebrity doppelganger? Uh, I've been told I look like the, um, uh, what's his name? Rami Malek? Rami Malek? Freddie Mercury's, uh, yeah. the actor who played Freddie Mercury. Or the guy from, hear, um... So that one, I've only gotten a couple times, but I do get the, uh, the the Miami Dolphins head coach, Mike McDaniels, a lot. Michael McDaniel. I used to be a Dolphins fan. I should Whoa! Yeah, that one is absolutely striking. It's really weird. Yeah, he even has the glasses on. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a little bizarre. <laughs> That's funny. Look at that. Well, he's got yeah, the long hair, the short hair. He's got all the, the looks. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, I'd say that's the winner for me. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Are you superstitious at all? I'm a little bit superstitious. I uh, not not to the point where it impacts my you know like daily life, but if I've been kind of running good in a certain sweater or something, I'll continue to wear it. And if I've been running, I, I have burned two shirts in my life because I've run bad in them. But it's but it's more as like a uh, comic event versus truly believing that the shirts are are rigged. You know? Yeah, it's a nice ritual that you don't really believe in. Too exactly. Much. Yeah. <laughs> what about phobias? Phobias. Um, I don't like enclosed spaces very much. That's about it. I, uh, I yeah, I, I don't like being like in a confined space for a long time. Longest session you ever played? Uh, not super long compared to most players. I've I've only got maybe like twenty-ish overnighters under my belt. Uh, I would guess forty between forty and fifty hours is my longest. Do you like telling people you're a professional poker player? Uh, yeah, actually, a lot more nowadays than I used to, and I, I do it selectively. It's like you know, I don't necessarily like to do it when I'm in a cab because I don't want to like hear everyone's bad beat story. But you know, if I'm if I'm like at the park in my neighborhood talking to like the neighborhood dads, I do like it because I, yeah, it's I'm I'm proud of it. I think it's unique, and uh, and I think that I I think that it establishes people that I do and don't get along with fairly quickly based on their reactions to it. Yeah, it's a great, you know, quick measure of somebody. <laughs> yeah. To see how they react to it. That's that's interesting. Um, do you have a nemesis, somebody you can't beat, or somebody who's always held over you? Uh, yeah, I've got a few. <laughs> you want to give them shout-outs? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> I understand. Any near-death experiences? Ah, uh, near-death. I mean, you know, what qualifies as near-death? I've had a couple experiences climbing that that felt pretty scary. Um, and then I knocked myself out on a surfboard once, but came to pretty fast. Ooh. So, uh, on, yeah. So realistically, probably the surfing one was the closest that I got to dying. Cause you know, if I just don't come too fast, I probably do die. Um, oh, this didn't happen in a surfboard shop. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not. Uh, yeah. And I'm climbing. I've, I've, uh, I've fractured my ankle a few times taking big falls, but nothing that like felt like I was going to die. What's a famous movie that you've never seen that people give you shit over? Uh, uh, Star Wars. What? Yeah. What? Yeah. What? That's just my, yeah, my wife is a it's, it's, it's weird, you know? You've never seen any of the Star Wars? I've, 
I've like I've, I think I've seen you know maybe like uh, one of the newer movies here or there, but I don't know like the Star Wars story. Wow, well, and you saved yourself quite a bit of time, that's for sure, <laughs> and, and space in your brain. You know, you, pr- you probably yeah. fit a whole language in there just just if you take out the Star Wars in my brain. Um, <laughs> What about your bold prediction for poker's future? Um, I think that I think the poker's future is healthy. I think the tournaments will continue to grow. Um, I would, you know, I I mean, as someone that's negatively affected by it, I'm not a huge fan of uh, the privatization of uh, casino games. I would love to see that reversed somehow. Um, but uh, but it sort of is what it is, and I understand why it happened. Um, but yeah, I think that poker's future as a whole is bright. I think the tournaments will continue to grow bigger and bigger. All right, and we end the podcast the same way every time with a question from the random question generator. Right. Who knows what it'll be? What compliment do you like to receive the most? Uh, interesting. Um, so it has to be a compliment you do receive. <laughs> right. I mean, I guess, you know, it's weird. It's hard to think of, like, some direct compliment that I've been given. I, you know, I get complimented on my dog a lot, so I guess I'll go with that. <laughs> You're a good dog owner? I am a good dog owner. I'm definitely, you know, I'm definitely overly uh, thoughtful of my dog. There you go. Well, congrats on the bracelet number three. Um, congrats on the wedding anniversary. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Congrats on your, your beautiful dog. Um... And thank you so much for spending the time and talking. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It was fun. That's it. That is the show. Thank you once again to Mike for taking the time and sharing the stories. You can find out the latest on him at Twitter. Oh, I guess it's called X now. At GordoMG. You can also follow us at Card Player Media. Until the next one, thanks for listening.